<laughs> I would like to try something different from what I've been doing on the Hebrew grammar. <clears throat> I've done a number of videos where I have put out inductive Hebrew grammar in many uh, passages of the Hebrew Bible. I've done what I understand to be all of the Messianic Psalms, looking at each word grammatically in Messianic passages. And I would like to do something now to see what interest there might be for beginners. And let me just say that uh, having taught Hebrew for uh, around 40 years or so, and a little bit about my background, I did my THD work at Dallas Theological Seminary. And I had uh, in that program, through my doctor, through my uh, Master of Theology, I had four and a half years of Hebrew, or about, I should say, three and a half years. And then for in the 80s, I earned my master's degree at the Dropsy College in Hebrew Bible and a lot of grammar. And then also at uh, New York, NYU, I finished my PhD in Hebrew and ancient Near Eastern languages. So having taught Hebrew in seminary, I was chair of Old Testament at Weinbrenner Seminary for a number of years where I taught Hebrew every year. And I went through grammar inductively. One of my real passions of teaching language is to do it in an inductive way. And we put out a number of grammars on YouTube that basically where I read the text and I look at each word grammatically. One of the things that I've been encouraged to do, I have a class of a few students where we're just, where they're just almost in, really in the beginning stages of Hebrew. And we started working through Psalm 23 with them, looking at each letter and word, and not only each word, but each letter, each consonant, each vowel, grammatically explaining the grammar. So I'd like to address this lecture to beginners, to those that are just starting. And it's not for advanced students. So what I would encourage is if you're a beginner, I would encourage you to get a Hebrew Bible to follow along. And then I would encourage getting a basic grammar for years, I used wine green in my own teaching. I really appreciate wine green grammar very much. But whatever grammar you use, I would first of all learn the alphabet and learn the vowels. And then you can begin following me as we work through uh, the text together. I would like to work in Psalm 23, which is such a wonderful, wonderful psalm. It's a wonderful psalm to encourage our hearts as well as our mind in learning Hebrew. And so I would like to work through that psalm and look at each letter and each vowel. So if you could learn the consonants and learn the vowels, <laughs> then we will pronounce it and slowly work through it. There is a statement in uh, Pirkei, actually it's in uh, Pirkei Avot, which is a little tractate of the Mishnah. And in it, in chapter 6, it says that if one learns a single chapter, a single halakha, halakha, a single verse, a single Torah statement, a single letter, that that's important. And I remember uh, a rabbi once said 
if you start slowly, then you can pick up speed as you move along. If you try to go fast, you'll go slow in the end. If you go slow at the beginning, you can go fast in the end. So I would like to address those that are just beginning Hebrew and really have not had any Hebrew, but would like to learn to read it a bit and get into it. So we're using Psalm 23 since it's such a marvelous song. There is a statement that I think is very powerful. It was found in the Soncino uh, series on the Psalms and Reverend Cohen, uh, Rabbi, I should say Reverend Dr. Cohen <clears throat> on page 23 introduces the Psalm as the divine shepherd as follows. Truly, it has been remarked the world could spare many a large book better than this sunny little song. It has dried many tears and supplied the mold into which many hearts have poured their peaceful faith. He's quoting from another author at that point. One of the most precious gems <clears throat> in the treasury of biblical literature, its appeal to the human heart. Not only that, but it's been that appeal <clears throat> to the human heart, constant and incalculable. The reason for this is not far to seek. The meaning and helpfulness of this perfect little psalm can never be exhausted so long as men like sheep wonder and need guidance, and so long as they learn to find it in God their shepherd. The Targum, which is the Aramaic translation of the Hebrew, gives it a national application as praise of God, who fed his people in the wilderness, and this reading has been accepted by some of his medieval Jewish exegetes. However, and I agree with Cohen on this point, it is more natural to understand it as the testimony of personal experience. And I truly believe that's true. As a Christian minister and having taught in seminary for a number of years, this psalm, I have used uh, and done really Hebrew, inductive Hebrew grammatical with uh, grammar with it many times. And my burden in teaching Hebrew, and especially as we're beginning, is to do it inductively. That is going through a live text and looking at every letter and every vowel and thinking about the grammar laying a foundation that way. I would encourage you to couple this with a good Hebrew grammar, whether you use Weingreen or Lambden, uh, Ross, whatever Hebrew grammar you use, work through it, it will give you a deductive approach. My passion is inductive, but it's good to augment the inductive with the deductive. And that, I believe, I would encourage you to do. First of all, one needs to learn the alphabet, the consonants, followed then by the vowels, and then the half vowels. And once one has learned that, then one is ready to begin to read. So let me just start. I'm assuming that you will do that. And what I'm going to do is read the text in Hebrew slowly, followed then by looking at each letter and each grammatical point in a very, very slow way. And we're only going to do verse one in this video. So we read, Mizmor le David, Adonai Ro'i. Lo Axar. 
a psalm belonging to David. The Lord shepherds me. I will not lack or want. Let's start with Mizmor le David. Mizmor means a song belonging to David. Notice the consonants in Mizmor. We have a mem, and underneath the mem, we have a hirig, which is like an I vowel, an I sound. So Miz, then we have a Zion, and notice we have a Shiva under the Zion. Those are two dots that are basically a, what we call closing, the horizontal closing uh, the, the uh, syllable. Notice Miz Mor. You don't hear it, it's silent. And grammarians call that a silent shava, that is S H E W A. Uh, the older pronunciation would be shava, uh, using it with a modern Hebrew pronunciation. The W is pronounced like a V, shava. So Miz Mor. You don't hear the shava. It's a silent, what we call a silent shava, and it's closing a syllable. A syllable is a consonant vowel consonant or a consonant vowel. Here we have a consonant vowel consonant and it's closing that syllable. So we read it mis mor. Notice mor, again, we have the mem, followed then by another vowel called a holam vav. We have the vav. And notice that little dot at the top. And this is a long, this is a, an O vowel. So it would be Ms. Mor. And that final consonant is a resh. So Ms. Mor, and Ms. Mor means a song or a song. Ms. Mor led David. Notice led David to David or of David. Notice the lamed, the next consonant is what we call a lamed, and underneath it we have a shava, but this is a vocal shava, mizmor le, and you're hearing the sound. A vocal shava is the same, it's a half vowel, as grammarians call it, <laughs> and you now have it being vocal because it's beginning a new phrase. Whenever it begins a word or occurs after or begins a new syllable, you'll have it'll be vocal. So le David. Notice we have a dalid, and this is followed underneath. And notice vowels go underneath or between letters. Le David. That vowel underneath the dalid is what we call a commas. Q A M commas E, uh, sort of a S with a dot under a commas. Basically, it is a long A vowel that what looks like a little T. Le David. The next letter is a vav. And underneath the bob, we have a hirig. And that's that little uh, dot underneath the bob, followed by the dolly. So it is mizmor le david. And notice you have that little wishbone at the, beside the bob here, uh, le david and beside the hirik underneath the bob, that wishbone bo a bone is called an athnach, A-T-H-N-A-C-H. And that means like a major pause. So mizmor le David, a psalm belonging to David. By the way, that lamed le David is a preposition called an inseparable preposition. You have 
a lamed inseparable preposition meaning two or four. You have a kaf and you have a bait. And here we could translate this a psalm belonging to David. This could be a lamed actoris, that is a lamed of authorship, looking at the Latin. So a psalm belonging to David. Now, scholars differ as to whether we're looking at a psalm being added to the Davidic collection or whether it's a psalm that David personally wrote. I have no problem reading it as David's own personal writing of this psalm. As a shepherd who understood the background of shepherding. And by the way, as I go through this, as a Christian minister and teacher, I also will bring in the New Testament. And uh, so and when I go to the New Testament, the word David is very significant to me. By the way, David, if you're going to look at numbers, uh, in Jewish rabbinic sources, they have what is called gematria, G-E-M-A-T-R-I-A. -E gematria is where letters are put together to bring meaning. And when you look at the way Hebrew numbers work, you have Aleph, Beit, Gimel, Dalet, He, and Vav. Those are the first few letters of the Hebrew alphabet. Aleph is one, Beit is two, Aleph, Beit, Gimel is three, Dalet is four, Aleph, Beit, Gimel, Dalet, and then we have, I always, I always learned it in a song, Aleph, Beit, Gimel, Dalet, uh, and then we, uh, then we have uh, hey, and then a uh, vav. Aleph, beit, gimel, dalid, hey, vav. That's the song I was thinking of. And uh, vav means six. So if you add four plus six plus four, you equal the name David. David meaning David. And uh, it is interesting, it means 14. And it's sort of like double perfection. I once asked a friend whose name was David to remind his wife that that meant double perfection. And he said, well, I can do that, but I'm not convinced she would believe that. So, <laughs> but 14 is seven doubled. And it's interesting from a New Testament perspective. If you look at the book of Ezekiel, <coughs> chapter 34, it talks about how David would come someday. We're looking forward to the final David. And I think Ezekiel or Yeheskel is looking at the Messiah, the Messiah. And it's interesting to me as a New Testament uh, teacher as well, when I look at Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, I believe Matthew works on that gematria by saying in the genealogy of chapter one, there are 14 generations from Abraham to David, 14 from David to the Babylonian captivity, and 14 from the Babylonian captivity to Christ. So what is fascinating to me is that I believe Matthew is reminding his readers, his Jewish readers, that the final David has arrived. And he has uh, David appearing, or number 14, appearing three times. In Jewish thinking, if you have two or three, you establish a case. And here he's giving three witnesses, I believe, uh, of the number 14, which I think is driving home. To Matthew's listeners that the final David, the final David has come in Christ, the fulfillment of Ezekiel chapter 34. But then we move on. Adonai Roi, Lo Exar. Maybe at this point I should make a statement 
that Hebrew was originally a consonantal text. By that we mean uh, when, when Jesus would have read the Hebrew Bible, it would have been read with consonants alone, much like the newspaper would be read in, let's say, Israel today. The vowels were added <clears throat> by a group called the Masoretes. <clears throat> and Masoretes, M-A-S-S-O-R-E-T-E-S, -S -E -E the Masoretes, were the traditionalists. They followed the oral pronunciation and created a vowel system. And so the vowels were added later. Uh, but when the text would have been read prior to that, it would have been read just from rote, from memory, as to how it was pronounced. And I think uh, it is interesting then to keep that in mind. So as we move on, to the next phrase, Adonai Ru'i. Notice in Adonai Ru'i, we have a Yod, and below it we have a Shiva, we have a He, and then we have a Holam Vav, then we have that little T underneath the Vav, a pa thought, then we have another hey. Now what's going on here? It is interesting that the word yod hey vav hey <clears throat> early on was seen to be so sacred that you don't try to pronounce it. So what the Masoretes did, they took the vowels to Adonai, which would have been master. In Adonai, you have what is called a hate pathot, that is a hurried pathot, because it was under a guttural, Adonai. You had a holim, an oval, a noon, an Adonai, and then <clears throat> an a vowel, uh, Adonai, followed by a yod. So what happens here is that the Masoretes took the vowels of Adonai and artificially put them in <laughs> to yod heh vav -Hey, so that when the reader would come to that word, they would not try to pronounce it. They would pronounce Adonai rather than try to pronounce Yehoah. And I think that's important. In uh, modern Jewish reading of the text, especially Orthodox Jewish reading, uh, they will often read Hashem, Hashem meaning the name. And since this was so sacred, early on, we lost how it was pronounced. Now, it could have been pronounced Yahweh. Uh, and modern scholars, a lot of them, will have that Yahweh or Yahweh. Uh, what's happening there, if I could just explain it, uh, the verb here is Hava, the verb to be. And that yod is what we call a prefix. And with that prefix, it's a third masculine singular. And so if it was Yahweh, by the way, there are seven stems in Hebrew, what we call Cal, which is your basic stem, your Nifal, which is your passive of the Cal, you have your PL, which is your intensive stem. Then you have your puel, which is your intensive passive stem. You have your hifil, which is your causative stem. And your hofal, which is your causative passive stem. And hitpiel, which is your reflexive stem. So in these seven stems, some have said maybe the original reading was Yahweh. And if you take that reading with that yod prefix, it would make it a hipfil stem. That is, he will cause to be, or he causes to be. The imperfect can either be present tense or future tense. And so in a lot of modern reading of this word, they would read it Yahweh. However, another possible reading would have been Yeveth, 
And that would be something like uh, he is or he will be. Yevet. And that would be seen as a cow stem, if that's the way it would have been read. And that would be he is or he will be. And some want to read it almost like a Joseph. Let him be. Uh, basically, we don't know how it was originally pronounced. These are just some possibilities. Let me just say this. When you look at this uh, word, though, it's definitely, uh, since we don't know how to pronounce it, we should pronounce it either Adonai or Hashem. If we're trying to follow what the Masoretes uh, wrote, it would be Adonai. And that's the way we often pronounced it in class. Now, what is interesting to me, uh, the word Jehovah was often uh, brought into play here. But there is a problem with that. And that is, when you read the way it's pointed in the Masoretic text here, it would have been, by, by what we mean by Masoretic text, the Masoretes added the vowels and this is then the text that we call the Masoretic text. But if we would read it something like uh, Yehovah, we really can't read that because we would need another Vav. In other words, Yeho, we would have had a hole and Vav. Then we need another Vav, Yehovah, but we don't have that here. What we have is Yehovah. And to my understanding, we do not have that kind of a combination or diphthong in Hebrew where we have a whole and vav and a pathok brought together. Uh, we have other combinations, but I'm not aware of any combination like that. So Jehovah is really not a name that we could uh, use. By the way, the J instead of the Yehovah, the J comes from the German. Uh, Yah is often Jah. So uh, uh, again, I still sing the song, Guide me, O thou great Jehovah. <laughs> but basically, when we look at this word, it's important to understand that it cannot be read as Yehovah. We need another Bob to do that. And we would have to separate that from the whole of Bob. Uh, years ago in seminary, one of my professors used to say, uh, people need to understand the tetragrammaton. <laughs> what he meant was the four letters in Hebrew, the yod, the he, the vav, and the he. And, and basically, uh, that is something that I think uh, he was being somewhat uh, serious and yet humorous at the same time. And that is uh, because tetragrammaton is a Greek expression meaning the four letters as to what it really means. So that's what's going on in the way this is pointed in Hebrew. And it's interesting if we, if we render it he will be, Yevet, uh, I have a friend who uh, had me for Hebrew. And he said, Gary, I think I'm going to read this as Yevet. Uh, because in the New Testament, Jesus said before Abraham was, Ego Eimi, I am. Going back to Exodus chapter 3, Eye, Asher, Eye. I will be, or I am, that which I am. And there it is a cow in perfect first person plural, or first person singular. And so he preferred to read it, a cow in perfect third masculine singular, in light of the New Testament. He is. We don't actually know how it was pronounced, but I do believe that Jesus is applying that to himself as one who is eternal, as the eternal divine, uh, uh, can I say, son of God, or the God-man, when he said before Abraham was, Ego me, 
which the people would be reminded of Exodus chapter 3. Uh, a yeah, I share a yeah, I am that which I am. But at any rate, the Lord is Roi, my shepherd. Notice here we have a resh, and then between the resh and the ayin, ayin is the second consonant, we have a holem. So ro, now we have under the ayin, we have a dot and another, looks like a comma. That's a herik yod. That's a long I vowel. So Adonai ro e. And by the way, ro e is what we call a participle. And in Hebrew, we said there's seven stems. This is the cow stem, which would, which would be the ground stem, or the, some call it the G stem. That is, the Lord shepherds me. He is, he is a shepherding Lord. Uh, and by the way, this is very personal. And to identify a participle, you have an O vowel. Uh, let's say you wanted to take a word like shomer, he is keeping. You'd have an O vowel followed by a tseri, shomer. Uh, he keeps, who shomer. But here it's ro'i, and that final, there is a final consonant that has elided or dropped out. That is a final he. And the word for shepherd is ra'a with a final he. And these final hey verbs at one time, can I say, were final yod forms. And the hey was added later. But here, this hirik yod is looking at a personal pronoun suffix, first person singular. So the Lord shepherds me. And it's very personal. Uh, it doesn't say Adonai ro'enu. The Lord shepherds us, but Adonai Ro'i, he shepherds me. Very personal. And then lo exar, uh, not I shall want, or I shall not want. Notice lo here, you have your lamed, which is your next consonant, followed by your aleph and your holem. That a uh, little dot between the lamed and the olive is called a kolam. So Adonai Ru'i Lo Exar. By the way, I should say one thing about Ru'i. In Hebrew, the reason it's called a lamed he verb. Grammarians often define grammar around the verb pa'al. At least some older grammarians, by older I mean not necessarily in age, but older in terms of older grammars. Uh, you had a pe, an ayin, a pa, al, and a lamed, meaning to do. And so they would often say if you had a noon beginning a word, that's a pe noon verb. Or if you had a, let's say, a he at the end of the word, that would be a lamed he verb. And that's what we have here in ra'a, where the he elides or drops out in this form here in the laman he verb. Uh, you, could, you could also call it a final he or a laman he. There's different ways of, or nomenclature in defining uh, grammar. So the Lord shepherds me, lo, not, a negative particle, uh, exar. I will not want. Notice exar means to want or to lack. And notice as we look at this uh, word, we have the aleph, exar, followed by those triangle of dots called a segol. It's a short e vowel, lo exar. Then we have the chet here which is a guttural, lo echsar. And notice ech, uh, this again is in a closed, unaccented syllable. And so you have a consonant and a vowel and a consonant. 
and het here, that shiva, those two dots, perpendicular dots, uh, I said horizontal above, but, but perpendicular uh, is what we're talking about, where they're one on top of the other, exar, I shall not lack. By the way, you look at the hey in yod hey vav hey, and look at the het, and how that the line goes all the way up and touches the top, where in hay it goes up, but there's a space between the top line. And in that space, you have a hay in that, in that letter. Here, you have a chet. You have what is called a guttural. It's pronounced in the guttural part of your throat. So lo, lo, ech, sar. And then finally, notice you have a samic. And uh, this is then, underneath it, you have that little T again, which is your comets, your long, your A vowel, I should say, lo exar, and then your final resh. So Adonai roi lo exar. Again, in Hebrew, we have what is called perfect and imperfect. Perfect is looking at a completed action often in the past, but not always. Uh, and future, uh, either present or future. So exar is a future. And when you take an, and it's called an imperfect because the action is not completed, like in the perfect. So I shall not lack. And when you have exar, Basically, you are looking at an imperfect cow, and this is a simple, we call a simple stem, and that Aleph is first person singular. So Adonai shepherds me, lo ek sar, I shall not lack. And it is interesting here also that we're looking at the Lord's constant comforting care. And it's very personal. And at the end, we have these two dots. They're called a sof pasuk. S-O-P-H-P-A-S-P-A-S-U-K. U pasuk. We could say C-H. Sof pasuk. Sof means the end of the verse. And those two dots are like our period in English. So Adonai Roi Lo Exar. The Lord shepherds me. I shall never. And Lo means never. Like you have that uh, negative particle in the Ten Commandments. Lo. Uh, if you wanted to say never shut the window, you'd say Lo. Never shut the window. You'd say, don't shut the window now, it would be al. But here, it's, it's looking at a negative particle that shows ongoing, can I say, uh, help. I shall, like, never want. I shall not want. So the thing, as we look at this, let's read it once now in Hebrew slowly. Mizmor le David. A psalm belonging to David. Adonai roi, the Lord shepherds me, lo exar, I shall not want or lack. And I would encourage you to read this psalm over and over and work through, first of all, the consonants of a grammar, work through the vowels and the half vowels, and then I hope if you follow my discussion that it will help uh, solidify the grammar as well as worship the Lord. Uh, it is interesting in uh, the commentary of Cohen, I appreciate his introduction, but also his comment on the shepherding work of the Lord. In a pastoral community, the faithful shepherd stood as the personification of tender care and unwearying watchfulness. 
and men gratefully applied the term to God as the provider and protector of his human flock. Its earliest use in this sense was made by Jacob, who spoke of the God who hath been my shepherd all life, all my life long. Genesis 48, 15. The imagery is found in the prophets in Isaiah 11, excuse me, Isaiah 40, verse 11, and Micah 7, 14, and frequently in the Psalter. And how true that is. The Lord is seen as a shepherd throughout the Hebrew scriptures. And so we can have a simple, uh, calm faith in knowing that it's very personal. He shepherds me, I shall not want. And as a Christian minister, I go to the teaching of John in John 10, where Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. And the good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. And we're also told that Jesus had said, as the good shepherd, he would never leave us nor forsake us. And so, again, as a Christian minister, I make application as I'm going through this inductive uh, grammatical analysis. I hope this is helpful. Uh, and I hope this helps if someone's just beginning Hebrew. I would get a good grammar and I would learn the alphabet first. I would learn the vowels and certainly get a Hebrew Bible. If you have translation on the other side, that would be great. And follow along in the discussion of Psalm uh, 23, verse 1. Thank you. It's been a joy to share this.